thank you so much for joining me today for this afternoon curatorial tour of American Weather Vanes, The Art of the Winds. Um, the show is curated by guest curator Bob Shaw and coordinated by me. I'm Emily Javalt, curator of folk art at the American Folk Art Museum. And as I've just mentioned, I'm gonna be providing an overview of the show today, uh, talking about some major themes and selected weather vanes from the show. And in about a, a half an hour, I will uh, turn it over to you for questions. So um, feel free to, to make note of your burning questions and, and we'll uh, talk at the end. So this exhibition is so exciting for us at AFAM. Um, it's the result of many long years of research on the part of our guest curator, Bob Shaw, who is also the author of the excellent book by the same title, American Weather Vanes, The Art of the Winds, which is available in our shop. The show is made up of about 50 beautiful, painstakingly selected, visually striking veins which cover a range of forms and moments in American history from the 18th century into the early 20th, which is really the time period representing the weather veins heyday in American life. Many of the veins in the show are drawn from private collections and really represent an opportunity to see a spectacular and highly unusual assembly of these objects. So if you're able, if you're in the area, I hope you will come to the museum and see them in person. So this tour is really just uh, the beginning and, and will whet your appetite for more, I hope. One of my favorite things about the show is how it considers weather rains from multiple perspectives. And among these interpretive lenses, which I'll talk about today, are elements of art history and craftsmanship, as well as scientific analysis of weather rain surfaces, issues of social history and identity, as well as the history of collecting weather vanes as folk art beginning in the early 20th century. But we'll start with some earlier history because weather vanes do have a very long historical trajectory, not only as tools to show the direction of the wind, but really as aesthetic objects. And they've been designed from the beginning to capture attention visually. These are objects that actually have ancient origins uh, and have been made globally for centuries from Greece to China to the present day. The weather vanes in the show are American. They represent the American tradition of vein making that sprang up as English and European craftsmen brought their skills and their visual vocabulary to the American colonies beginning in the 17th and 18th centuries. This banner form, which is on the title wall of the show and is a, a really a beautiful monumental form, is of a type that carried forward to the United States from actually a much earlier period. So in the Middle Ages, veins actually took their name and their form from heraldic flags, which at the time were called fanes, hence veins. Um, these were flown from castle towers, at first in fabric, uh, in fabric form as proud displays of family coats of arms. And so this example is really a descendant of those early banners. Um, this, as you can see, was made in Maine in the, uh, the mid 19th century. And one of the most beautiful things about this example is this gorgeous red glass center to this sort of tail of the vein, which glints in the sun. And you can just imagine how beautiful that would have been up high. The rooster is another weather vane form with a uh, centuries long precedent. So the rooster actually became a symbol of Christian vigilance in the 700s. Um, looking at uh, as, a, as a symbol of the story of Peter's denial in which Peter predicts that, uh, I'm sorry, in which Jesus predicts that Peter will betray him three times before the cock crows. So uh, from that time on in the 700s, the rooster becomes a popular choice for the top of church buildings and eventually becomes a choice for other public buildings, as was the case with this remarkable survivor from late 18th century Maine. Um, this is really unusual to have a survival from the 18th century of a weather vane made of wood. The gilding was probably part of what protected it over time. Um, we really don't see that many examples like this because of course weather vanes were made to be outside and those that were made of wood rather than metal did degrade significantly over time. So this is a really special example to have, um, to have in the show. Another rooster, 
seen here on the left in a watercolor, um, was crafted by Shem Drown, who is a weather vane celebrity. The first American born weather vane maker that we know about. Actually, if you're a, an archive nerd, you can go and see his account book in the American Antiquarian Society in Western Massachusetts. But this vein is actually still in use in my hometown, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, so we have represented it here in the show with this beautiful watercolor made in the 1930s for the Index of American Design um, at a time when, when veins were really making a resurgence as collector's objects. And, and we'll have more about that later. Um, but I also want to uh, comment on the photograph that you're seeing at right here, which is a wonderful late 19th century image of this same weather vane at a moment when it had been taken down from its perch. It was actually being transferred from one church to another at this time. The photo has this amazing uh, sense of, of scale of many of these objects, but also gives this wonderful suggestion of, I think the kind of pride and sense of relationship to, to weather vanes that people have historically had. You can see uh, so many of them represented creatures of one kind or another, and they easily take on a, a sense of animacy and even personality, which I think is intimated here by the way these, uh, the, the sexton of the church is positioned uh, almost as if he's in conversation with the rooster. So early weather vanes like these were crafted as unique objects. And they were often made by craftspeople like Shem Drown, who were doing other kinds of metalwork or woodwork as well. They were doing what they uh, were able to do to, to survive and prosper. And uh, they weren't necessarily weather vane specialists. But in the mid 19th century, weather vane making really underwent a major transformation and started to become big business. Vane makers like Alvin Jewell in Waltham, Massachusetts, which was a center for weather vane making, uh, vein makers like Jewel became increasingly specialized and got better and faster at production. Concurrently, competition between vein makers soared and they developed new methods for advertising, like this wonderful broadside that you're seeing here that showcases a range of Alvin Jewel's wares. So, vein makers in general started to offer a wide range like this of forms that could be reproduced in different sizes and offered at different price points to accommodate the needs of their customers. And here's just a wonderful close-up of some of the, of the options uh, uh, that you could acquire from Alvin Jewel. And if you visit the show, you will see we have an example of the eagle form, um, a monumental eagle uh, at left. And we also have an example, two examples of this form, the goddess of liberty on the right. And I'll be talking about one of those a little bit later. So this step up in production was, was partly made possible by changes to the craftsmanship process. And we have some examples of this on view in the show as well, as in this uh, wooden pattern on the right, uh, which was of the type that was used to create molds for reproducing copper weather vanes. So a beautifully articulated carved wooden pattern like this would create a detailed negative mold. You're seeing an example here. Um, uh, being put to work at the New England Weather Vane Shop, which is a, um, a contemporary um, weather vane shop that uses historical molds. But you can see here how he's, he's taken the mold uh, and is hammering the sheet copper into the mold so that ultimately you end up with um, two identical sides, which are soldered together. You can see the seam along the, roost, uh, the, the squirrel's face and um, his tail here, but it also goes all the way down his back. These two sides have been soldered together to form the hollow bodied uh, copper weather vane. So the key to making a vane functional is that the front portion must have a greater weight to it, such that the tail catches the wind and rotates and the face points in the direction of the wind. Copper weather vanes were typically finished using this multi-part process that's illustrated here. Um, and also in the book through the research of conservation scientist, Dr. Jennifer Maas, whom we were fortunate to collaborate with on this project. So the typical layer structure for finishing a molded copper vein involved, um, if this is the, the copper, there's a, a base of primer followed by size or uh, adhesive, 
um, and then topped with gold leaf, which is just exactly what it sounds like. It's a very thin um, gold that, that adheres to the surface um, created by these various layers. And so through this process, you get a beautiful luminous surface, like the one we're seeing here in this fabulous goat from the show. Uh, and then over time, the exposure to the weather uh, can result in a surface like this, or it can, um, it can result in one that is a much greener copper, um, oxidized copper color, which takes on often a very velvety quality that collectors, um, collectors really prize for its sense of history. You also see uh, painted weather vanes like this one from AFAM's own collection. And this is actually over time, this, is, this vein has really become an icon for the museum. It's one of our earliest acquisitions uh, gifted to the museum by Adele Ernest, who was a, an early pioneering collector of weather vanes. Um, you can see here through more uh, research from Jennifer Moss, who did a microscopic uh, analysis of the lips um, on the, uh, the angel weather vane. Um, as these objects were taken down from their perches and refreshed, resurfaced over time, the original surface layers were not necessarily stripped down to the base. So you can see in this photo image here, there is not one but two layers of white primer followed by red paint. And you can see again, white primer followed by red paint. Um, and the, the coexistence of these layers really provides a sense for the vein's history of use and reuse over time. Throughout the exhibition, a major theme is the emblematic function of the weather vane as a symbol uh, of, the, uh, of some underlying social concerns of a given moment in history. As the crowning ornament on top of a building, weather vanes were often chosen to symbolize a certain sense of status, uh, pride, and identity. So with the rest of my overview today, I'm going to share some highlights of weather vanes from the second half of the 19th century and into the early 20th as examples of some of the social changes taking place during this period. And I think you'll see um, that in the sense, these objects really become kind of cultural texts that can be read as, um, as documents of moments in time. Throughout the history of American weather vanes, patriotism and American identity comes through um, you see this here in this iconic goddess of liberty, which I mentioned and pointed out on the Alvin Jewell broadside that we were looking at a moment ago. Um, for those of you who need a refresher on the history of the Roman goddess Libertas, um, she provided the model for this personification of liberty, um, which became popular originally during the American and French revolutions. And she was traditionally depicted like this, carrying a flag um, on a staff and wearing what's called a Phrygian cap, so a soft cap that folds over at the top, um, which itself became a symbol of freedom and democracy. Um, but although this imagery dates to this earlier period, it actually um, is a, a, an image that carries through the 19th century and was probably especially appropriate at the time this vein was made, um, just after the Civil War, when the country was in a moment of trying to uh, heal and reconstitute itself following the Civil War. Now, as I mentioned, Alvin Jewell was the original designer of this form, but you see the name Cushing and White uh, on this example. And that is because um, Jewell tragically died um, while at work. He, uh, his scaffolding failed while he was installing a vein and he, he uh, plummeted to the ground and, and died, I believe about a day afterwards. Um, but Another influential firm, also based in Waltham, Massachusetts, Cushing and White, bought Jewel's patterns and hence continued to offer this form among other aspects of his inventory. Um, some really nice details here. You can see this crimped applied sheet metal um, wreath uh, around her neck. And you can also see these stars have been cut out. So there's some really fine detail in this example. Also, a really wonderful feature here is the Cushing and White stamp for this Goddess of Liberty vein. It's quite rare to see a stamp like this. Um, so some years 
after the, this Goddess of Liberty vein was produced, New York Harbor Statue of Liberty became another source for a weather vane form, as you can see here in this example. Uh, when this was advertised in the catalog of J.L. Mott, who was a, a vein maker based in New York and Chicago, uh, he actually felt that he needed to point out that this vein was modeled after the Bartholdi Statue of Liberty erected on Bedloe's Island, New York Harbor. Of course, this island is now known as Liberty Island and the Statue of Liberty needs no introduction, but at the time um, she was relative, relatively newly installed. And so this was pointed out by Mott um, as, a, as a point um, to make for, for those of his clients who, who might not be living in New York and might not be aware of, um, of this form. So wonderful close up of her. You can see these, these great applied elements uh, to the crown. So, also during the late 19th century, fantastical forms were very popular. Uh, we can see an example of this in, this in this very large and complex witch riding a broomstick, which was made by an Ohio maker. You can see, uh, you may be gathering that many of the early weather vane makers were based in Massachusetts. Um, but over time, these businesses also sprung up in New York and moved out. Uh, to the Midwest, to Ohio um, and Pennsylvania as well. W.H. Uh, Mullins, based in Ohio, was also known for his work on the famous Diana weather vane that sat on top of Madison Square Garden. Um, and it was thanks to his skill and uh, means of, of producing large veins that he was able to, um, to provide this innovation. Here's an example which needless to say is not in the show, but just to give you some, some further historical context, this wonderful weather vane um, was um, on the left was, was actually mounted and found to be too, too large uh, for scale. Um, you can see there, the, the workers provide a sense for the scale. Um, so it was, it was um, refined and remodeled um, in a second version, which you're seeing on actually on top of Madison Square Garden on the right. You can also read more about this story in Bob's book. Um, so just to go back to the witch briefly, I will say that um, this is sort of a, uh, this is a very Victorian witch. We know representations of witches on broomsticks date all the way back to the Middle Ages, um, but later manifestations of this kind of imagery became more benign as people stopped actually believing in witches. Um, and I think this particular one actually she has a, a, a fragile and sort of sensitive aspect to her face. And she's very beautifully balanced on top of this moon, which I think emphasizes her, uh, the, the aesthetic appeal of this object over any lingering implications of fear or evil, but very much part of a Victorian kind of sense of, of fancy at this time when there was an interest in, um, in mediums and the spirit world uh, that was uh, particularly um, popular in, in this era. So here we have um, from, from um, around the same time period, a fearsome dragon positioned in the act of scaling its pole. He, uh, like the, the very first weather vane we saw, there's a glass element to this, this wonderful red eye, um, which, would have, which would have glinted in the sun. And here you can see in this historical photograph from the early 20th century on the right, um, you can see uh, the vein in situ um, on top of a bank building in Warren, Pennsylvania. We actually don't know who, uh, who made this particular vein, but it is, it is certainly a special one and a great one to, to see in person as well. So another theme that really comes through in weather vanes of this time period is that of innovation. A lot of change taking place in uh, the technology of transportation in the late 19th century. Uh, when this vein was made around 1880, the transcontinental railroad had only been around for about a decade or had only been complete for about a decade. And um, so in this context, in this context, this vein would have would have felt um, would have felt like a symbol of, of progress and innovation, um, which would have also been communicated through the, the, the massive scale of this vein, um, which 
if you if you see the show in person, you will get a, a, a wonderful sense of this touring car and driver, of course, heralds the arrival of the automobile. And uh, this vane was made in 1910, uh, which makes it one of the latest weather vanes in the show. Uh, after this moment in time, um, the weather vane business does start to recede. Uh, there are fewer, uh, there's um, the agricultural economy starts to shift such that there's less of a need for uh, weather vanes to top barns. Um, and the advent of technology um, makes them less popular. But at this, this is a wonderful transitional moment where you see the technology really brought into the vein um, industry. This particular example has such an incredible level of detail. It makes you wonder why uh, a maker would have lavished such detail on something that was going to be positioned so high up that you couldn't see that. And I think that's really a testament to um, to the level of competition amongst makers, such that uh, uh, you know, craftsmen really wanted to, um, to, to demonstrate their skills through the kind of detail that, that would bring in customers and could be appreciated at ground level um, by, by patrons. This was originally positioned on top of a gas station in Lexington, Massachusetts, which would in itself have been a novelty at the time. Um, and just to go back to this, locomotive, this was uh, originally on top of a train station. So yeah, there's often this sense of connection between the, the purpose of the building and the, the vein as a symbol, but sometimes there isn't necessarily that connection. Um, in an example, oh, here's just a wonderful close-up of, of the touring car, which you can see has all these complex elements to it, um, including a, a, the man has a foot on, on the brake. Um, this airplane, actually was made for a somewhat surprisingly made for a hotel in Maine. And we're not quite sure why the hotel decided to commission this particular vein for that, uh, that location. But nonetheless, it's a wonderful uh, example of, of um, wanting to, to, to represent sort of the, uh, the, the, the being on the cusp of technology. This is a, a vein that actually is a carefully observed um, reproduction of a small airplane flown by Louis Blériot across the English Channel in 1909. Um, here's a picture of him on the runway before his flight. Uh, so we can imagine that the excitement around this um, Blériot's uh, um, trans-channel uh, trans journey could have been the reason that, um, uh, that that really resounded around the world and uh, made the hoteliers in Poland Spring want to, to celebrate this particular achievement. One of the reasons that there continues to be this special appreciation for American weather vanes today is that these objects became of great interest, especially beginning around the 1920s, to modern artists and to collectors and dealers in what was then really a new collecting category, becoming known increasingly as American folk art. Like a number of weather vanes in the show, this unique sea dragon weather vane on the left was, quote, rediscovered during this era in which modern art and folk art were growing up alongside one another and influencing one another. So it was actually the artist who created this watercolor um, of, of this same weather vane, Dorothy Hay Jensen, who uh, stumbled upon this upon this weather vane driving through Maine. Uh, she says she nearly ran her car into a ditch when she saw it on top of a barn roof in Warren, Maine. And it really is an exceptional form with this uh, very fearsome face and its undulating body. Um, which, looking at an example like this, you can you can also understand the the, the appeal of the, the simplicity of this graphic form, which really does resonate with modernism uh, as much as it represents an earlier moment in time as well. So I mentioned uh, earlier the American index of design for which this, uh, this watercolor on the right was made and for which the watercolor of the Shen Round rooster was also made. The American index of design, or rather the index of American design, was a, a highly influential works progress administration project that was part of what helped the, the, to cement the weather vanes 
status as uh, an iconic American graphic form. And since AFAM has been a champion of the weather vane from the institution's earliest years, as I mentioned, one of our first acquisitions and also one of our first exhibitions um, involved weather vanes. It's especially exciting to be sharing this show during the museum's 60th anniversary years. So I'll close today with some photos of the exhibition installation. Again, just to tempt you to come and see the show in person. You can see here, there are many more examples of weather vanes that I haven't yet shared, including this spectacular Hudsonian curlew, which was positioned on top of a sporting club in New Jersey, this wooden sea serpent, both of these examples are in the AFAM's collection and were included in the seminal folk art exhibition in 1975, The Flowering of American Folk Art at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, and uh, this fame weather vane is also uh, in AFAM's own collection. Some more examples here. We have another pattern here in this uh, wooden fox which you can see was used to produce a weather vane um, that's on view behind it. And then lastly, you'll see um, a gallery that's full, not only of examples of innovation and fantastical forms, but also horses, including a wonderful polo player, um, uh, positions on top of sporting clubs and barns were were, were major as uh, spots for weather vanes, uh, as well as the public buildings within the urban landscape, some of which I've mentioned today. 